Let's do that. Don't do that again. Joan, can you hear me? I can, Miss Vizina. Okay, just wanted to double check. I can. I made you a co-host to share documents if need be. Thank okay. you. Appreciate it. Ray's all set, Joan. Um, I'm sorry. Also, we're not starting the meeting yet because there's no school committee members here, I don't believe. Okay, we're on standby. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I don't have any problem running the meeting. <laughs> I just can't vote. It looks really ugly, but look. I muted us. Oh. They're not uh, having any other extra meetings this month. They've got everything that they need. They'll just be having the regular two meetings. I just want to make sure this is for like parents too, right? To sit through. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Mini meeting. Just so you guys know, that's my daughter's, I'm on my daughter's tablet, so that's why it's her name. <laughs> and it's covered up because I'm trying to eat supper too, so. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I did that about 10 minutes ago. You're fine. I had to lock myself in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> She's waiting for Hello there. Hi, good evening. But you know what? It's six o'clock. So it's running live right now. Oh, mobile video. You're doing good, right? It's a lot of so 
personas. I'm trying to watch. Mr. Murphy. Yes. Have you moved from that chair since this afternoon? I did get up and made my wife supper. <laughs> but now I'm back in the chair. Yep. Yeah. That that was that a long mean, <laughs> Does that mean Larry's not waterlogged this week? No, no, not this week. <laughs> no. Is that on? I don't see him yet. You gotta be wearing a suit and tie. I don't know if he's wearing a suit and tie tonight. After, after making us wear one Friday. Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> I didn't have to wear a suit, but I'm about melting. Bye, Sophia. She said bye. <laughs> Dad King's on. I not in a suit. Dad. Blue devil mask. It looks like. <laughs> I wanted him in a suit and a robe. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has a couple of smart dogs. <laughs> I always it's a flag. Felicia, the dial-in number. She's on the road. Okay. I hope she's not going to dial in while she's driving. Well, she's only on the highway going 85, so it's no big deal. That would not surprise me. No, I don't know. She <laughs> definitely had pulled over to get the number. <laughs> Most cars have Bluetooth built in now, too. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You cannot use your phone while in car unless you have Bluetooth. That's a law now. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to tell that to half the people I see on the road. 
Only half. <laughs> I was going to say only half. I, I pay attention to the road the other half of the time. <laughs> oh, or the ones that go around the media in the wrong way. Oh. Yeah. I don't understand how you hit that curb so many times. <laughs> Do this. So are we just waiting for Rowan now, Joan? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, she's only the chair. <laughs> she might be having a hard time connecting. Does she have internet? She's been trying for 10 minutes to log in. I just got. Uh, Do we have an update on how many people we still have without power? Last time I looked, there was only about five. I, I had a lady, a lady just posted on Facebook down by Otto River that there's seven of them and they won't get power until 11.59 p.m. on the 7th. Ryan, get power. Oh, wow. High Street doesn't have it yet. Yeah. Well, I know High Street doesn't have power because my son doesn't have it. I just got power and I live on Otter River Road. Oh, so they are getting to Otter River now. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got it. Yeah, I Thanks just got goodness. power. I just got power in Harvardston this <laughs> afternoon. So same thing. <laughs> finally. <laughs> that national Grid's power on the map. Yeah, was finally. A little bit off then. Uh, Larry, just can you little. send? Excuse me. Can right. you send Moran the call-in number? <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can hear a baby. <laughs> oh, she's all set. I got her. All right. Hi, Rowan. They did Uh, Felicia says she's on hold, Joan. On hold. Can you hear me? It's Felicia. Hi, oh, Felicia. Yeah, Felicia. Yeah. How are you? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hi, no, Felicia. No <laughs> Hello. All right, I'm going to put myself on mute so that I... Is that all night? <laughs> <laughs> No, you wouldn't be so lucky. You know better. <laughs> did you say you had Rowan? Uh, I did. I go. let her in. I, I finally log in. I, I'm having connectivity issues again. Um, I hope I solved them. So I apologize no. for um, being late. <laughs> it's okay. I've been trying for 10 minutes to connect. <laughs> that happens to me often. So are we ready to go? So we are, we have about 68 participants that are still coming in, but um, actually I just want to wait three minutes. Do you want to give up? Yeah, three minutes. Sounds good. Excellent. Maybe just a reminder for people that aren't talking that might be new to the Zoom meeting that if you're not talking, maybe mute yourself because it helps with interference and everything. Um, this is Felicia. Can we also remember to identify ourselves when we're talking? Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you. When um, someone put in the chat room, someone asked about the MEMA, uh, the, how many families are still without power. It's actually uh, 649 now. Um, and Jason Morey shared that with me because it's access to the MEMA map. 
Joan, where is the where is tonight's agenda? Why am I not seeing it? I sent it in, email, but I can send it again. Did you say there are six forty nine people without? Yes, it's actually increased. You know. Yes, it's actually increased. You know. What do you mean, it is, is that just Winchester? Yes, he's, he lives in Winchington, yes. And now, Joan, this is Felicia again. How many people are on the line with us? 68. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, here's the posting, the um, agenda. You just sent it? It's on the screen. Do you see it or no? I don't. Okay, I'll, I'll send it. Are you sharing it? Trying to. I'm not having fun sharing it sharing today. <laughs> It's not working. Jessica, I'm going to send it to you. Come on, get one. I'm trying to do this thing. If you're just coming on, if you could mute your yourself, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Zena, I just sent you the agenda. If you could share. Just waiting for my email to come through. Not a problem. We're still at 67 or 68 people now. Are we ready to begin? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rowan Demanch. I am the uh, um, school committee chair for the Wichita Public Schools. And I'd like to call this meeting to order at uh, 6, 11 p.m. on August 6, 2020. I'd like to start the meeting with um, uh, allowing the public to know who's present tonight for school committee members. So if you could please identify yourself um, for the public, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, Rowan. Felicia Nermson here. Thank you, Felicia. Hi. Greg Vine. Hi, Greg. Mm -hmm. Larry. Larry and Karen. Hi, Karen Cast here. Hi, Karen. Larry Murphy here, vice chair of the school committee. Good evening, Larry. Um, Good evening. So tonight, uh, I just want to, we have a pretty hefty agenda this evening. Um, it is on the screen. I'm gonna quickly run through it for um, 
Uh, those of you who do not have it on your screen, who are just calling in on your phone in one minute. But before I do that, I would like to um, know if there's anyone out in the public Zoom world that is um, personally um, recording audio or video of this meeting other than the Wichita um, town. Okay. So we're gonna move forward. We have a pretty um, um, long agenda tonight with a lot to discuss. Um, I'm gonna go through the agenda really quickly and then have Joan start the meeting. But this evening, we are going to get a COVID-19 update. We're gonna discuss the budget update. Um, we are going to look at the remote learning commitment form we are gonna look at the busing opt-out form. We are going to review the three models for um, the COVID-19 final plan that's due to the DESC now on August 14th and the school committee will vote on that. We will also take a look at the revised 2020-2021 school calendar and the school committee will vote on that. We will then move into public comments school committee comments and then at the end we will be moving into um, executive session so i'd like to start the meeting tonight by having joan review the first few items um, giving us a covid 19 update um, the budget and the remote learning i also want to remind the public that we um, do have a comment section because we're in Zoom that they can type in at the bottom. We'll review those uh, questions um, as we proceed through the meeting and we um, also will cover them at the end um, during the public commenting uh, session. So Joan, do you wanna start us off this evening? Sure, I'll give a quick um, update on what I know about um, COVID-19 in the state and in as of last night, there was 91 cases that have been reported total um, across um, when the virus started. Uh, the World Health Organization released information today on states uh, across the country, and Mass has a 2.88 positivity rate, which is uh, they're looking for. Um, this is help states reopen um, and stay opened. They're looking for a 5% or lower. Um, they're reporting um, right now that it's a 2.88%. I will tell you, uh, we've been told, I've been told um, that they're looking for tighter metrics to use in the Commonwealth. And they're also looking at um, ways to get testing in, into the schools. So I just wanted people to know that those are things that the um, state is working on. As far as uh, personnel and the budget, um, at the last meeting I spoke about the state uh, was going to vote on a budget and they actually uh, did vote on that the next day. Um, our FY, the FY20 unrestricted restricted local aid is, um, level funded uh, the same as in FY20. And um, the uh, chapter 70 actually was is the same as FY20 with an inflation rate. I was telling, I was on a meeting this morning with a lot of parents and school people, and we don't know what that um, inflation rate is. No one does, they, they haven't um, said that. That being said, I've met with the, um, town administrator um, yesterday and um, he told me to proceed with planning with the budget that the school committee voted at the public hearing. Um, I was able to call back 12 employees last week. In total, since July 2nd, we have reappointed 21 employees um, and I will continue to update you on any further movement. The remote learning and the busting um, out um, opt out form. Unfortunately, we haven't had internet for a couple of days in the uh, district. Um, 
So what I'm going to ask is after the vote tonight, I'm sending out electronic commitment form. I'm going to ask people um, to commit whether they are interested, whether they're going to send the child back to, back to school if that's the vote, if people are opting for remote learning, and if um, parents have applied in the district uh, for homeschooling. And also, this will be the final uh, busing form, so uh, we can get the buses ready to roll uh, if we do indeed uh, return to school. General statement, um, this these decisions that um, schools are making right now around the Commonwealth, um, these are fluid. Um, what the school committee might vote today could change two weeks ago, depending on the transmission rate and what information we receive. Um, we had to come up with the three plans uh, for the community. Um, so I just wanted people to know that, um, that it, it could change at any time um, with the information from the state, no matter what's voted tonight. I think that's important for people to realize. Thank you, Joan. Do any school committee members have any questions or comments about those items? Madam Chair. Yes. It's Karen. Karen speaking. Sorry. I do want to respect Felicia's request too. Um, you know that um, we have the agenda set so that we vote go through the um, three models. Mm -hmm. Wondering if, just because I think public comment um, after the vote kind of seems a little bit you know, cut after, you know, before the horse. So if we can move the public comment so we can hear from parents, we are trying to factor in what our community wants into our vote we can try and move that before we actually take the vote. So I don't know if I need to make that a motion or how we want to do that. You have to make a motion, yeah. Karen. Well, okay. and if I could, um, just for review of how um, I anticipate the um, models going and Larry, Greg or Felicia um, could step in and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is I would like to review each plan, um, have Joan give a summary of each one and allow us to vote on each plan separately um, so that it's very clear what um, the decision is by the end of the evening. Um, I don't disagree with that um, school committee and the public can have questions or comments after each one of those sections. Um, but I we would need a motion for that. Okay, so um, can I make the motion that we, as you just said it, that we have public comment after each um, section is gone through so that the public can comment on each plan before we vote? I have a second. I'll second. Can we discuss? Can, okay. We need a yes. second first, then we can discuss. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. So you, so you have a, a second and now we're in discussion, Rowan? Yep. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do any school committee have comments or discussions about the motion? Yeah, I guess. I guess I'm a little. I don't know if confused is the word, but um, the idea. So you're saying that we vote on each proposal one at a time and that 
public comment follows each vote? Not the vote, prior to the vote. Okay, all right. I was going to say that seemed to defeat the purpose. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Is Felicia, I seconded it for you. Didn't you didn't you have something you wanted to share? Did we lose her? I don't know. Felicia? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, actually, Greg just verified it. So uh, that was my question, is that if we were taking, <laughs> I just, I, I guess I don't understand how we, how we want to work that. So we'll have, con we'll, we'll go through the plan. Joan will summarize the plan. Then we'll take public comments. Then we'll vote. And then we'll move on to the next one. Is that how we're going to structure it? That was my thought. This is Rowan, by the way. I'm sorry. I, I keep missing that. That was my thought so that the community is clear about each plan and then I'll give them time to ask questions or comments and then to know what our vote is as a school committee. But That's great. Uh, so go ahead. May I ask, this is Larry, can I ask a clarifying question, Rowan? Yeah, go ahead. Normally, what would happen when we have, after uh, Joan goes through the three models, somebody would um, put one forward and it would be seconded and then it would be discussed. And if it's yay or nay, then if it's nay, then we would go to another model. If it's yay, then um, that would be. That's the that, point. That would be the one. So my humble recommendation is Joan present the three models. We have comment from the people here tonight on each one if they would like. And then somebody puts forward a recommendation that is seconded. And that's the one we discuss and vote on instead of voting on three of them. You know, I find actually either way, this is Rowan again, I just want it to be clear to the community what each plan means and allow for discussion and questions and uh, be clear about what our vote is going to be and not any confusion or muddled into, because um, I do know um, just from past meetings, there are confusions with plans on um, whether you know, for example, in hybrid, are you allowed as a family just to pick remote? So I don't want it to get um, confused. And so either way, I just want it to be a clear process for the community that we um, demonstrate the plans and know what our vote is. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, this is Greg. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with Larry, basically, we, that we go through all three and then as he said, have someone put forward a motion and vote. If it's accepted, then great. And if it's not, then we'll move on to another one. Uh, I, it seems a little cumbersome to vote on each plan as they come up. Um, and then, you know, once we've heard all three, the, com the community has had its chance to comment and we, when we take our vote, then that would, would be it. My hope is once we take our vote, and that's our vote that we're not going to go back and, and rehash everything again, just, you know, for the sake of beating a dead horse, unless, of course, that motion is defeated. Yep. I'm fine with that. Is everybody okay with that process? Rowan, this is Felicia, and, and I'm fine with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, at this time, we still have a motion that has not uh, been voted on. So we need to, def uh, if, this is Larry, uh, Madam Chair. So if we vote yes on the motion, then we're gonna go through all three of them and vote on it, all three of them. Correct. Which is what Greg and I were not in favor of, right? 
No. We have a, we actually, let me rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that fun? And, and I chair? apologize. I just want to be clear because this is kind of an unprecedented vote. And right. there's a lot at stake. And I want to be very clear about um, how we do this process. Okay. I apologize for the procedural piece. Um, but if we could um, make a motion to have all three plans reviewed uh, by the superintendent and then open it up for school committee questions, comments, and the public's questions and comments. And then the school committee uh, can make a recommendation on one of the three plans. Is that agreeable? Right, but we have to, def we have to defeat Karen's motion first. Can I amend it? You can amend your motion. Yeah, you could. Okay, so so let me amend the motion. <laughs> so I will amend my motion, and I know I'm not wording it correctly, but... Um, we'll know what you mean. Yes, you'll know what I mean. So I'm amending the motion to say that we... Um, that Joan presents all three plans um, at once. We go through them. And then we allow public comment on the plans, and then we can do school committee comments and rec and then have our discussion, our robust discussion, whatever, and make our re recommendation and do our vote. I'll second that. That is the motion I am now making, amending my motion. It's seconded. Uh, I'll second that. <laughs> We have a second. Yeah. Se Greg seconded it, so we're good. Yep. Okay. So. So now, Madam Chair, you call. Let's move the vote. Move the vote. <laughs> Hold the vote. <laughs> move the vote. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I. So Joan, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you have the floor. You are going to present all three plans. Okay, and, and we'll have public comments and questions, school committee comments and questions, and then we will move forward with a recommendation and vote. So you have. Okay, to so thank you. So I'm re reviewing the plans we presented last week, the leadership team, and I'll um, actually uh, Jonathan's help. Putting them, putting them up on the screen for me, for us. Uh, I lost it. Sorry. I do much better in person, everyone. I'm sorry. Well, actually, I have it. So the, everyone... the plan is on the screen. It's on the screen, John, on our screen. I know it's never on my screen, Larry. <laughs> oh. Can actually go. I can actually go to. Um, I have the PowerPoint here. So the first uh, model was opening um, school um, in uh, person for all the children of Witchington. That was the in-person model, and uh, we a full return to in-person not feasible due to space limitations and the very large number of staff we would need. And it's important when I clarify beyond the FY20 levels. Now I can say beyond what we had in the um, budget. Can you, before. can you move the slide up, Jonathan? You want to go to this one? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, you've got the hybrid. She was talking about a full opening, and then we've got the hybrid model up there. That's why I was waiting. Yeah. Okay, so beyond the FY20 levels, Port Town would need a, an additional six teachers. Memorial will need an additional five teachers. Middle school, seven teachers, and the high school, seven teachers. With these calculations, we, we are not able to... Um, accommodate model and also um, 
accommodate lunch being served in the classrooms. So the next model is the hybrid. I'm sorry. Um, so the structured time on learning in the hybrid model is the elementary five hours a day, secondary 5.5 hours a day, and the teachers will deliver between 25 and 26 hours a week in a combination of face-to-face -face and synchronous remote instruction. And the instruction will um, be in sometimes in the whole class and we're also um, the elementary curriculum and remote learning committee work very hard to see how they can come up with a structure to form um, small group instruction for our students. I want to add with this model, um, the administrative team talked about um, it would give um, students time to, to meet their teachers, to form connections um um face to face it's um two when uh cohort a would attend school two mornings a week and cohort on monday and when tuesday and cohort b would attend on thursdays and fridays i want to remind everyone in any model it's very important um that children with um uh, intense learning needs um, need under special ed, they would attend every day. Um, also, we also in this model built in a second tier of high need students that needed um, who have um, different services on their IEP or also 504 plans that they could also attend um, four mornings a week instead of the two. So we we made accommodations for um, children with high special needs and also ELL students. The last model is fully remote. Um, I want to clarify that any family um, in Wichington, Wichington can choose this model. So it, for whatever reason, they do not uh, feel that they want to send the ch child back to school. I've heard from a lot of people um around um you know medical needs anything that you don't have to explain you can just um tomorrow or the next day when i send out that form you just can sign up for the fully remote learning plan uh, student learning will be a co combination of synchronous asynchronous independent study and technology assisted learning um, the different platforms that we're going to be putting in place. The school day would accommodate the teaching of all core academic areas and disciplines. We, in all, all um, in the um, hybrid and the remote, there will be uh, training for students and parents um, because uh, we learned from um, different issues that came up from March to June, and we want to make sure that everyone uh, receives the information they need for this to be successful for our parents. Uh, attendance for all students in hybrid and remote will be taken daily. Um, we have to report that um, just like we would if we were in person to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. And there'd be five hours for the elementary students and five and a half for the middle and high school students in this model. I also was asked this morning, I just wanted to, before I forget to say this, we have not received, well, we hadn't received feedback from DESC on our preliminary plan that we submitted to the department, but I just received an email um, a few minutes ago, a memo that other districts received also, um, just telling us what to make sure um, that we all make sure that certain things are included in our final plan. Also, the commissioner at 1230 today let everyone know that the final plan is not due to the department until Friday, August 14th. So um, people that asked for extensions, people that didn't wait, it's all due by August 14th. So I wanted to make parents aware about that because there was discussion in a morning meeting about that. Thank you.
Thank you, Superintendent Landers. Um, this is Rowan again. Um, I we um, I could ask a clarifying question. Um, I noticed that you have a five hour and five and a half hour um, piece on the, well, you had set it for the remote plan, but you had also set it for the hybrid, but then said students would be in school for half days. Do you or your uh, um, principals know or have a prediction of hours um, just so families would know what that might look like um, coming to school? Sure, absolutely. I'm going to actually ask Dr. Lamon to address that. Okay. Yes, we do. I'm sorry, uh, Ryan, Ryan, could you just quickly repeat the question? I got it. I was distracted by something off off to the side of the screen. Just that's for a okay. Yeah, the hours. Do you guys know what hours you'd be um, uh, recommending for students to actually be in school under the hybrid model? So, um, I believe there is um, a, a new update in our in our document, and I've got Michelle and Mary here to back me up if I'm getting this wrong. But I believe the um, instructional hours, the hybrid instructional hours, would be from 8.15 to 3. That's the window. But I'm actually going to see if one of them wants to confirm that because they were looking at the plan today and I was out of district today. It, the school day would actually start at, yeah, 8.30. So it's more, it's more like, yeah, it's more like 8.30, um, 8.30 to 3, correct. So you're, yes. you're, close, you're close, Jonathan. I'm looking so, at the plan right here. Are you saying that students under the hybrid model will be in the school building from 8 to 3? No. no. So, okay. for so the we student, can clarify that. Yeah. Yes. For, well, so first of all, in the hybrid model, um, uh, cohort A and B students are only there two mornings each week. Um, and half the kids are there on Monday and Tuesday morning. The other half the kids are there on Thursday and Friday morning. Um, the cohort C1 students would be in school all day. Um, uh, and cohort C2 students would be in school four mornings a week, but um, no students, uh, but, but, but most students, the majority of students would not be there for in the building all day. Okay, so and lunch would be not- Grab and go. So it would grab and go. Great. Madam Chair. Yes, Karen, go ahead. Just to feed off your clarifying question, so I guess to, I, I think the question that I was going to ask in relation to that is how many hours per day are you expecting the students to be in the building in the hybrid model? So we're saying five hours or five and a half hours of learning per day. So how many would actually be in the building for those two half days? So the, those two half days, the, the school morning would be approximately 8.30 to 12.15. Yes. Okay, thank you. And Michelle, can you clarify what happens for um, the students um, in cohort A in the afternoon? So for students in cohort A, when they, so if they're in school in the morning in the hybrid model, they would grab, they would have their grab and go lunch. And then from there, obviously they would go home. And at that point they would be doing independent work packets and or assigned resources um, such as Happy Numbers, eSpark and, and the same as Toy Town as well um, from the teacher. And to be clear, on Monday and Tuesday afternoons, teachers would be interacting remotely in a synchronous way with the students from cohort B. So all kids would have some face-to-face -face time, either in person in the building or via um, the internet each, to each of those four days. And on, the, and on the Wednesday, there would also be small group instruction for children, but on a much more limited basis. Mm -hmm happened for cohort b so yeah it's really just they they're they're there all kids would have small group instruction on wednesdays but on monday it's cohort monday and tuesday it's cohort a and a in the building in the mornings and working independently in the afternoon in cohort b 
having synchronous remote lessons with their teacher in the afternoon, but working independently in the morning. Um, and then on Thursday and Friday, it's reversed. Cohort B is in school in the morning, and cohort A uh, is receiving synchronous remote uh, instruction um, uh, uh, in the afternoon. I would also add that um, we're, it's looking more promising that we may be able to include the students who are independent and remote in a kind of morning meeting model so that they would have a chance to connect with their teacher in the morning before going off to do their independent work. But we are still just kind of pressure testing the technological issues there. Thank you. Suzanne, I don't know if you wanted to add something about cohort one and cohort two. I don't know if she got kicked off. Sorry. No, I'm here. I'm sorry. Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so as far as cohort one, what we're looking at are students that are um, currently, based on their IEPs, um, being serviced through our substantially separate programs, our all programs, um, and for the public, all ALL stands for Alternative Lifelong Learners Program. So we have one of those programs in each of the school buildings. So first and foremost, it's our hope that we would be able to return those most high need, intensive need students to the optimal level of in-person instruction as possible. So that would be cohort um, C1 for special education. C1, we would be looking at those students, if we were operating on a hybrid model within the district, we would be looking at those students coming to school four days a week for a full day. In C2, what we are talking about are students that may require multiple services, but are not part of the substantially separate program. So for example, a particular student could have ELA, math, science, behavioral, social, emotional, um, speech and language therapy, OTPT, they could have a myriad of related services in their IEP grid as far as pull out services go. We would be looking at bringing C2 students back to school in the hybrid model four mornings a week so based off of like the elementary school Michelle was speaking about, we would be looking at a start time for those students at 830 as well. And they would be in attendance on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So each of the school buildings, um, special education staff and principals have been taking a look at the number of students with those high levels of pull out services because we want to be fair and be able to give them the opportunity for inclusion services, being in a classroom with peers, but yet still being able to ascertain as much in-person therapeutic related service instruction as possible. So again, C1, we would be looking at full day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. C2, we would be looking at half day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Um, are there any public uh, comments or questions at this time? I am reviewing the chat box and will go through your questions, but just wanted to make sure there was um, no one that wanted to make a comment or question um, at this time. I actually did. Okay, this is you can identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Jody Sarsfield. I have a child that's in special ed. Mm -hmm. So Olivia has extreme asthma, and I am wondering how it's going to be for her to try to wear a mask when she has trouble even wearing one when we walk into a store. How would that work in school for her? I'm just worried about her hyperventilating or exacerbating herself to the point that it would really affect her is there there is still breaks throughout the day for them to take their masks off yes am i correct yes okay. um there's built-in breaks 
Okay, because that was Olivia's biggest concern of this whole thing. She wants to go back. She's just scared that she has to keep that on all day and there'll be no break. And I would also um, consult with your doctor um, and uh, see how they feel about that. Um, because there are going to be people, adults and children, who might have a condi medical condition. That's even at the state level if, if someone has a medical condition. So, but there are going to be break built in. Okay. Today. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Madam Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. If you had to identify yourself. This is Christina Ricard. I'm president of the Teachers Association. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a statement on behalf of the Teachers Association. We, the members of the Winchin and Teachers Association, understand that being in our classrooms with our students face to face is the ideal learning situation in normal times. And that is where we would truly prefer to be, but these are not normal times. There are numerous concerns that must be addressed before returning to school buildings is a safe choice while the COVID-19 infection is still without a proven remedy or treatment. We are fully aware and appreciate that the district is making every effort to address these concerns as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. But the sheer volume and complexity of these issues and the need to have everything in place before in-person school begins make this task virtually impossible to achieve by then, even with the additional time the commissioner has allotted. On behalf of the Winchin and Teachers Association, we request for the safety of our students, our staff, and all of our families that the Winchin and Public Schools choose to begin the school year in a fully remote model to allow the necessary time for all safety concerns to be fully addressed before transitioning to any face-to-face -face learning model. Thank you. Any other public? comments or questions. Um, I did want to just, I've been reviewing the chat box around um, some of the questions that I want to make sure we, I know um, uh, some of you are answering the questions in there, um, but I want to make sure around the plans that we uh, covered those. So. There was some clarification around the um, hours of the middle and high school on the hybrid would be 7.30 to 11.30. So what, what, it depends on the cohort your child would be in. Um, I also noticed that there was a question about remote learning. So would remote learning, if that was chosen, would students be accessing remote learning five days a week? Seven. Seven. Are you going into any reports right now? I'm just finishing up this. If you could please uh, mute yourself if you're just joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there was a question around um, if remote learning is the model chosen, would children access remote learning five days a week? Yes. Yes, and during remote learning, they would have online synchronous uh, sessions with a with teachers throughout the day, in addition to working independently at times. So it would be a mix of synchronous uh, and asynchronous, but all remote instruction. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. This is Felicia. Who is that speaking? Sorry, I apologize. It's Jonathan Landman, Director of Instruction Curriculum. Thank you. Apologies. Jonathan, this is Rowan. Could you identify or define synchronous and asynchronous learning, please? Yes, that's actually, thank you. This is Jonathan again. So um, synchronous remote learning uh, might be a teacher uh, on a, a, a streaming video like Zoom, um, like we're on right now, uh, with uh, either a whole class of students or with some part of the of the student uh, students in their class in a small group context, um, so that would be a synchronous remote experience. Um, uh, asynchronous learning um, could be a whole lot of different kinds of remote learning. So I was part of the elementary uh, group process, and at the elementary level, as Michelle was talking about earlier, um, the remote learning might include spending some time on. 
a math or language arts platform. It might include um, working with uh, some of the materials that the parents, that the teachers are sending home with children, including manipulatives, maybe art supplies, um, uh, uh, places where the younger children can do their writing, you know, uh, for, for their uh, writer's workshop experiences. Um, it may include uh, reading. It, will, it would certainly include reading. It might include reading books, but also reading online and then uh, responding to that. A whole range of some, some exploratory activities. Um, you know, if we're able to bring specials back, it would include um, some of those as well. So it's a, hopefully a very rich variety of, of experiences. I noticed in the chat there was a question about how much of the day, how much of the week would children be working independently? Um, I would like to say that um, one of the things that is hopefully going to be better this year uh, than it was this spring is that we will have time in this hybrid model uh, at the beginning of the year to get parents and children solidly uh, oriented to the uh, to the, the platforms and all the materials that they would be using. Um, we'd have the opportunity to set expectations around attendance and around turning materials in um, and create much more structure. And families will receive on a weekly basis a really clear schedule of the learning for the week and what's expected and how much time is anticipated the kids will need to spend on different things. Um, and we're hoping that all of that structure together will make it easier, but maybe not easy, for children to be able to complete the, um, work when they are not uh, in the synchronous mode. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's our that's what we're aspiring to do. Um, in terms of the amount of time that children would be spending um, synchronously versus asynchronously, um, uh, it's actually different by grade level. So for example, we wanted to make sure that we had time for, uh, uh, for small group instruction for uh, younger children. Um, in order for teachers to be able to spend time giving small group instruction, that's time that they would not be doing whole class instruction. So it means that each individual child will have somewhat less contact face time online with their teacher than they would as with the older kids. But it has the advantage of for younger children, that whole class instruction is much more challenging on an online uh, model and has the advantage of giving the, the, the teacher the opportunity to work with small groups and help um, move their uh, language arts math board. There's some other questions in the chat room. I'd suggest I add them to the FAQ on um, the website and also let everyone know um, if they if they have more questions. Um, we're having a district steering committee meeting at two o'clock tomorrow um, and you are welcome to that. I'll make sure I'll get out the Zoom link. Um, even after the uh, vote is taken tonight, we'll, we'll continue to have um, meetings that people can attend so they can get all their um, questions answered in a timely manner. Madam Chair? Is that you, Greg? Yeah, yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> this is Greg. Um, I, got, I have a couple questions, I guess. Um, first of all, and, and if you went over this at another meeting, Joan, I know I, I missed one uh, a few weeks ago. For completely remote learning, if that's the way we were to go, how are, how are the children, uh, special needs students who need intense one-on-one -on -one, um, services, how, how are they provided, whether it's speech therapy or um, you know, physical therapy, how, how would that be handled? They receive those services remotely, Greg. Um, if we go fully remote, they would receive it from um, the staff that um, they would change to re uh, remote um, sessions. Okay. Did that from March to June. All right. Um, just about a couple of other quick ones. Um, in terms of, I know you're doing the six, six feet of separation. Yes. Um, what What are the largest classes you anticipate in terms of number of students in a, in a classroom at any given time? Uh, it varies by the space. Yeah. Um, 
I would, uh, it depends on what building. A lot of the classrooms are 10 to 12. Okay. Um, some are more. Um, um, I'm going to ask that because he did all the measurements of the building and we actually walked to high school yesterday. What would you say is the average uh, amount of students in the classroom? I, like you said, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. All right. Um, I would say, you know, the high school is probably, I mean, on average is around, I would say 13. The majority of them yeah. probably are around 12. Um, I would say that toy, t so the, the middle school is going to be the same. Um, the rooms are basically the same. I would say Toy Town might, might come up a little bit to around maybe 15. Um, and then I think that really at uh, Memorial, those open concepts, you really might be more limited by what a teacher is able to sort of manage relative to the, the little guys, especially kindergarten and first grade on top of trying to manage sort of face masks and social distancing and, and hand washing and all those things I think are limiting factors as well. But um, certainly, certainly those open concepts support more kids, but I think there's a the limiting factor, like I said, is, is the teacher in the room. And, and no, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I think yeah. there's a lot going on there for the little guys who aren't used to school yet. Yeah. And, and finally, um, if we do the um, hybrid or the full on-site learning, um, has it? Are we going to be doing a definite drop-off in kids into the classroom, you know, in the morning, so that it, it's set in stone, so their parents aren't dropping off kids and they're mulling around outside the schools, waiting for it to open, um, which would increase the chances of exposure. It, it, it would be, um, we'd have to monitor closely and it'd have to be, um, the schedule will be very tight, Greg, absolutely. All right, thank you. You're welcome. This is Rowan. Um, Joan, I like your idea. I see a lot more questions coming into the chat that families want um, answered so that you, and you have a form for that, that you've put in a place for families to ask on the frequently asked questions and your yeah. forums. So thank you for that. Are there other um, uh, school committee comments or questions at this time? Madam Chair, this is Felicia. Felicia. Um, <clears throat> one question that I have is, are the new, Kind of regulations that are coming out, um, whatever we're we're trying to, uh, w w with what we're trying to do, does it allow for school districts to require uh, medical documentation for students that are not wearing masks, as well as medical documentation for students that do have pre-existing conditions that they are cleared to attend in-person school? That you do need medical documentation to um, not wear a mask and to not wear a mask pre-existing. Um, I, I'm not sure there's clarity on that, but I can get guidance. Um, obviously I would encourage, um, parents, um, if a child has, um, a medical, um, condition to, to, um, get that doc and they were going to attend school. I've had the reverse Felicia parents notifying me about, um, their, um, you no, know, they don't do not want the children. They want the children to learn remotely because of that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, making sure. Um, no, absolutely. I, I also see some comments in the chat box around the DESI guidance as far as um, students who test positive uh, and, and what we're expecting there. Um, I'm going to take a moment and, and I hope no one minds, but I'm going to share my own experience because I have not shared my own experience publicly. And, and I'm just going to say the reason why I don't like that we're sharing that information there is because while it's fine to say that somebody can return after 10 days or 14 days or whatever it is, I was presumed positive in March when they didn't have any testing and I still have symptoms of COVID. I'm still dealing with that. I have still been sick and it has not been a pleasant experience. So anyone who thinks that we, we should just go ahead and, and risk it and, and allow our kids and to be the guinea pigs and allow our teachers and our administrators, um, I just, I, I, 
again, the guidance that was just shared in the chat box. And thank you, Karen. I do appreciate that you are so diligent about following that and sharing that. I would say that that is really a personal decision. And you have to understand that this isn't the flu and that there are long-term symptoms and long-term results of this virus. So thank you. I, I appreciate it. But again, um, the 10 days, the 14 days, et cetera, I would hope that as a district, that when we have one student that is positive, we're going to shift gears quickly and we're going to shut it down <laughs> because there's too much risk for exposure. So thank you. Thank you. Are there other, 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 I'm sorry, I can't, we can't hear you. Look, somebody needs to shut their, uh, if you could please mute yourself. Mute yourself, please. Maybe. Madam Chair. Karen. Okay. Um, and Felicia, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I was just sharing that to answer a question in the chat, um, just because that is the guidance that was given out. Um, I had a, I, I think that what I've seen, and, and there are a lot of questions, I guess I would I wish that more of the parents would ask these questions verbally, um, and um, just because I think it would it would be helpful. Um, but um, I think one of the things is that I've seen a lot of questions regarding how these plans are going to be executed. I think that it would be helpful for parents to know that what what they're worried about is that, and, and I know from being in steering committee and in this that subgroup, and I have to say that it's been very amazing to be a part of these groups, that the parents' worries that what they experienced in the spring is not at all what they're going to experience this fall, but I think everybody's so nervous that it might be helpful, Joan, if you could, or if, if, you know, Jonathan or someone could talk a little bit about the fact that there is going to be a drastic difference between the fact that here in Winston, they had to maybe wait a few weeks to get anything um, in hand in how the kids started getting remote learning information. And I think that wasn't, that wasn't, of Winchenden, that was a combination of just everything happening at once. And I think that it would help if we talked to the parents and said, okay, you know, yes, we're going to have remote learning and everything. And I know that Jonathan talked about that a little bit, but we need to find a way to reassure them that there is going to be more than just a packet or we're telling the kids to do this work. So is there any way that we can clarify that a little more? Because I think that parents are very nervous that they're just going to be, that their kids are doing work and they don't know what's coming. I, I'm uh, going to give Jonathan um, an opportunity to speak, but the uh, nervousness and uh, I would say in uh, interactions with uh, superintendents across the state, um, there were every community had concerns about um, the expectations and how the rollout of remote learning happened in the spring. We have been, uh, we have um, an elementary curriculum learning uh, remote uh, subcommittee focus group and also a secondary. And they are working on expectations, um, expectate uh, the schedule everything that needs to be placed. We've spent a lot of time uh, in looking at new uh, online platforms for different uh, things for the students and 
with the help of the town's COVID money, we're able to purchase that. It'd be much more um, structured. The expectations are um, children are going to be graded. There has to be attendance. Um, there's uh, we have to monitor if students are not engaging. Um, so it's totally different. There's been a lot of preparation um, there. Um, once we get our document together, we, we have we're going to have about. 40 to 50 page document of everything that's happening um, in the district with that. Um, and that's that's why we'll continue to have um, meetings with parents to alleviate their concerns and let them know what's what's going on. Jonathan, did you want to add something? Or yeah, anything? sure. And, and maybe, so here's a few more things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, so first of all, I think it, you know parents' anxiety is very understandable. Um, you know, we are in a really uh, uh, new and different universe. And what happened this spring was obviously responding to a huge emergency. And even what's happening this fall um, is we're going to be on new, we're going to be in new terrain. Um, there are really profound differences. As Joan has already mentioned, we've purchased a, a variety of resources to make it possible for teachers to be able to provide a, a richer remote learning experience and we're going to be able to provide training to faculty before school begins to help help them to make uh, effective use of those tools over time and i'm sure there's going to be a learning curve for people still in those but we're going to be able to uh, draw on those resources there's also a lot more structure built in um, the, the uh, remote learning plans and the hybrid learning plans we put together really detail how much time each day kids are going to be spending in different content areas um, and which which resources uh, we're going to be tapping uh, for that work. Um, some, there's been a bunch of questions about some sort of accountability and, and, and uh, attendance. I think that those are well taken. Um, uh, and, you know, I think we're going to have some uh, conversations. This has not all been, uh, uh, you know, decided on yet, but we're going to have some conversations about what's the right way to take attendance and hold hold kids hit kids accountable in, uh, this fall, um, and I suspect that will include both uh, uh, during synchronous sessions, uh, keeping and keeping attendance and and uh, holding uh, uh, children and their families for, as accountable for being there and being being uh, you know participating fully. But also, there's a, a way for us to monitor uh, uh, whether kids are uh, are completing their their independent work and submitting it on a timely way. And, and that can be a really fun, important part of the attendance and accountability process as well in the structure uh, process. Um, I mentioned early, uh, earlier that there's gonna be a lot of support for far parents before we begin kind of laying out the details of how this is all gonna work. And there's gonna be this structured um, schedule that each family is going to receive for each of their kids um, that helps them understand what is the kids are supposed to be doing during that independent time. The kids will be able to use those schedules as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's also we built into the calendar time on a weekly basis for teachers to be um, in conferences with with uh, kids. I think we're still talking about exactly how frequently those are going to happen. We, you know, the time is not unlimited. But we know there's going to need to be direct support to families where they're going to be able to check, have, have a chance to check and say, this is what my child's struggling with. Here's what I'm struggling with. How do we proceed? And there's going to be that partnership, which I know there was to a tremendous extent this spring, but now there's going to be a structure and expectations uh, uh, for everybody, especially for the teachers around making sure that they're, they're, they're you know, checking in with everybody. And, uh, you know, that, that that's going to be really important as well. I don't know if the secondary... Uh, folks have more to say about about this at the secondary level um or whether my colleagues at the elementary level want to say more too but i just want to say one thing be, um about special ed after tonight's meeting uh whatever the vote um special ed will be holding uh parent meetings um to help answer any questions that uh parents might have um, in regards to that. I know that um, teachers at all levels are, are talking about how to provide extra, I can see there's some questions, extra help, um, office hours. There'll be a lot um, 
lot of communication uh, regularly with parents. We're using one platform for that um, so that parents and the educators and staff can communicate with each other um, through one platform. And I don't know if uh, anyone, Jessica or had anything they wanted to add in secondary. Thanks, Jonathan. So, Jessica, did you want to say anything? I, I missed part of what Jonathan said because my internet's not stable right now. <laughs> That's why I, it's hard to, it's a little hard to hear. Um, so I, I didn't catch part of what he said, sorry. Um, if you, Jessica, you could um, uh, let the um, public, he, he, sp he spoke about in the district, but focused on the, um, Elementary two, if you could share anything um, parents are worried about um, what the remote learning would look like um, come September, uh, what structures you've put in to make changes. If, if I may, Jessica, this is Felicia. If you go off camera, that sometimes helps. That, that's why I'm not on camera. Okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give that a shot. All right, okay. Oh, like Jonathan said, um, one of the big things that we found was helpful is that we did have um, tech lists um, and guides for the students each week. Um, what we did find from, you know, parent feedback um, and even kid feedback was a lot of that communication needs to happen consistently, um, you know, at, at a certain a day of the week, at a certain time. Um, Really, we found too that having meetings set aside for parents at a certain time, um, it's really that communication and that partnership and connection piece that we find is really important. Um, so if we are fully remote, uh, it, it's going to be setting up those partnerships with parents right away. That's going to be extremely important and building those relationships with our kiddos. Um, you know, we, we are concerned, of course, with um, student safety, teacher safety, um, and health. And we want to make sure that we have everything in place before um, anything gets started, whether it's hybrid or remote only. Thank you. I hope you heard that. <laughs> yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is Rowan. I noticed in the chat box, Joan, where are you going to post the meeting for the special education questions and the password? Could you please clarify where our parents can find that? You have to unmute yourself, Joan. Sorry about that. Um, that would be arranged by the special ed office uh, by Suzanne Michelle. And uh, we would post anything on the website. Uh, um, I don't know, uh, Suzanne's internet's going out back and forth also. And she texted me to make sure that parents knew that she would be holding special ed meeting. Thank you. Are there any other school um, meeting? Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, Greg. Um, just real quickly, I, you know, I just want to say that, um, if we were to go to the, to the hybrid model, I have all the faith in the administrators and the teachers and the, and the staff of the schools that everything possible will be done to keep both the kids and the teachers safe. But frankly, it's not what goes on at school that concerns me as much as what may or may not be taking place in the community. Um, I mean, if you go to any store, except for maybe Walmart and um, a couple of the others, but any stores over the border in New Hampshire um, where masks are not required, you see a lot of Massachusetts license plates and a lot of people walking around without masks. Um, you see people um, that, that seem to think that, that wearing a mask exhibits some sort of disloyalty to a political figure or party that, um, you know, listen to, to 
national leaders saying that children are basically immune to the to COVID, which is just silly. Um, and there are people that that I mean, even when there's a vaccine, you have people who are afraid that getting the vaccine is a conspiracy by Bill Gates to inject you with a chip. I don't know what the chip is supposed to do unless it's to update your Windows software. Um, and if the, if the entire community isn't behind this, if the entire community isn't taking the precautions that need to be taken to keep our students safe once they're in school, then it, it defeats the whole purpose. And, and at this point, until I feel comfortable that that's happening, I, I have an awful hard time uh, supporting any move that, that puts our kids back in school and, and the teachers, quite frankly. Um, we need 100% support from the community and from, and I'm not just talking about the, the parents of the students, I'm talking about everyone in the community um, because it's not just families that are being or could potentially be exposed to this. When you go into a store, you don't know who, who may have the symptoms and who doesn't. And um, until I feel, like I say, until I feel comfortable that, that the community is 100% behind following the science, um, rather than science deniers, then I, at this point, I feel like I have to uh, support uh, going with the remote learning only at this point. I have a couple of questions. My name is Kayla. Can I ask my questions? Kayla? Yeah. Kayla. Yeah. I would like to know what medical professional advice the school has seeked out before making their decision tonight. And it's clear that the board already made their decision. Um, so why are parents, why are our opinions not important of what happens with our children? What about our children's social and emotional? Is that not being taken into effect with our young children? Has the school seeked out medical professional advice? Joan, you're muted. Madam Chair, can I answer that? Yep, go ahead, Larry. I just wanted to let you know, Kayla, that all our decision making is based on information that we have received from the medical experts used by the governor and by um, the Department of Education. Those are where we're getting our information. Those are where we're getting the science from the medical personnel on how to proceed. There are, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday, the Commissioner of Education is um, having a meeting for all school committee members and for superintendents um, to further clarify the medical science and what needs to be done for reopening, no matter what plan that you use. Uh, we're not making this thing, uh, making this stuff up, Kayla. We're, we're basing our, our thing. And one more thing I want to say is that you, I don't know how you know that we've made up our mind because I don't know how, I, I don't know how the other four are going to vote. You've heard different opinions tonight on, on different ways. Um, I, I don't know how people are going to vote on the committee. So you, you have a better sense than I do, because I don't know. I would have, this afternoon when I met with the teachers, when Greg and I met with the teachers, union, I would have bet the farm that one of the plans was going to be the plan tonight. But after listening to uh, school committee members speak tonight, I don't know how they're going to vote. I really don't. We haven't made up our mind. And your opinion as you know your children. Parents know your children and a I know a lot better than, than we know your children. So it's very important that we listen to you, and that's what this whole thing is for tonight. Uh, we're, we're here to listen to you. We haven't made up our minds yet. I'm torn. I'll only speak for myself. I'm torn. I'm, I'm worried about a surge 
and what that could do if we send everybody back. We've seen that at other uh, other places around the country where they opened up schools to in uh, in person learning, and then they had a big outbreak of COVID. So I'm really torn about that idea. But on the other hand, I worry. I do worry about the uh, the social emotional learning of students and them being face to face with their teachers and being able to see even if they can't socialize like they did before but the fact that they can see other students and be in the building and have a routine i think that's really important for social emotional learning so mm -hmm. i i lean that way so i'm told the only one i'm not just for me i'm telling the only one i'm not considering is full in person right now that one for me larry murphy is out the other two i'm going back and forth so please understand that we are trying to listen and trying to make decisions based on the, the ready, read, readily available information that we receive from the governor's office and from the Department of Education. Uh, and we, we try and base our decisions on that. And we also have tried to base our decisions on what we're hearing from you. And that's why Joan has held those those different, um, I forgot what she calls it, but those different meetings with parents to get feedback. We also did surveys. We did surveys. So we're looking at all this information. So please don't judge us like that. That's not fair. I, I appreciate the school opening it up to parents. I did sit on many, many, many hours of those board meetings for the elementary learning plan. And I appreciate the Q&As that Joan has been doing. It's shed a lot of light on the behind the scenes work that everybody is doing. But 68% of the survey, the parents said they want their kids in school. And I appreciate that the school is offering full remote to the parents that want it, but that other 68% has spoken. And, and I just hope you guys take into consideration that 68% that want their kids in school at least part time. That's that's all I have. Thank you. And at the same time, there's more than I, you know, this is Rowan and I, you know, want to um, kind of extend on what Larry said. A, a decision hasn't been made um, and probably as far as I'm personally concerned as a school committee member, the hardest decision that will face us at this time, probably ever as a school committee member. And I understand and hear the importance of hearing the community with the 68% of students um, and parents wanting to be back in school. I don't think any um, school committee member or teacher uh, would disagree that the most or beneficial type of learning is in-person learning, period. And but we have to consider many factors in um, this situation and making sure that everybody comes back safe. So like Larry, I have not made up my mind. I um, would agree with Larry in the fact that a full in-person model is not the best model um, at this time. Um, but I want you to understand that we are trying to take everybody's um, piece into consideration, um, families, students, and including the staff that have to come in um, every day. Do I have any other school committee comments or questions? Hi, Madam Chair. Karen? Um, so I wanted to um, clarify, um, Joan, do we know, so I know we, we had the, Kayla was good enough to mention the um, parent surveys, and I know that we had, I believe that the WTA did a, a staff survey. Do we know where, can, can you tell us what came of that? Sure, I, I um, Chris, I used to, that was- yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I sent out the survey to the committee uh, yesterday. Could you address the numbers? I know there was like 94%, 94 responses. Yeah, we, had a, 
we had 94 out of 103 teachers responded to our survey. Um, we have 67% uh, of our staff either themselves or live with someone who would be at high risk from COVID. 51% um, of our staff, their preference would be to return full remote. About 45% said hybrid and you know about 5% said uh, full time in person. Um, what other information do you want from that? No, I just wanted it because we had been asking for it and I wanted it. I, I know that we saw it, the school committee saw it, but I wanted it shared with the public. John, no problem. Thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, because I think that's something that the public should know too, because I think that, you know, as, as Ryan said, that, you know, we do need to consider, um, you know, students and our families and, you know, obviously, um, students come first, um, and that is the focus always. Um, that's, that's why schools exist is to educate our children. Um, but we also need to recognize that without teachers, there is nobody to educate the students. And without the paras and the lunch ladies and the bus drivers, there's no way to, to staff a school. So we need to recognize that these people are human beings and that they have um, needs and they have um, the right to expect to, you know, voice their concerns too. And I think that sometimes because I think this is such a fraught time for everybody that I have seen online that people are, you know, kind of like, well, you know, I get it, the teachers are essential workers, but, you know, we can't ask them to do something that's going to put their, their family or themselves at risk either. Um, so I just wanted to know where we stood with that. I know that we're still negotiating, so we don't know where we are with that anyway. Um, one of the things that um, I think is concerning too is that, you know, I mean, we need to always recognize that there's, you know, um, there's, there's pieces that we haven't, I know that we mentioned in the meeting this morning, Joan, and you're going to kill me, but, um, you know, PE and art and <laughs> everything else that we're still looking into and that has to be thought about too down the line. Um, but whether, whichever way we go, and I agree, you know, I don't think any anybody came into this with their mind made up. I mean, I obviously wasn't in on the negotiations this afternoon, so I don't know what plan Larry thought might have been the plan, but um, this is honestly going to be the hardest decision any of us as school community members make, probably in our lifetimes, um, probably as people too, because you're, we're putting lives on the line. This isn't, this isn't a decision about, you know, who gets to, who gets the last lollipop. This is, these are lives. These are your children's lives. These are the lives of the people that work in our schools. And honestly, this will affect all of your, um, all of your families too in our community as a whole. So I think that we need to think about that very very carefully. Um, so I think that, you know, we're all very clear on that. I think that parents, um, I think you said there was 67%, Chris, that lived with or had. 67% either themselves or live with someone who is at high risk should they get COVID. Right. Now, the other question I guess I had, I noticed on that, that um, there were quite a few that might need help with, um, or might, um, just like other essential workers, they might have the same concerns as some of our parents, like how to adjust, 
how to help their children if their child's school was doing fully remote or something else. So that segues into, I know that when we spoke this morning, Joan, there was talk about the Clark possibly helping out with some of the, you know, um, kids on the days that they weren't in the actual schools. Um, but what other, I know I had mentioned before about essential workers too in other ways that, that might, we know that the Clark isn't going to be able to necessarily handle all of the students that would need it. So have we looked at any other possibilities? Are we exploring any other possibilities? Well, people brought up suggestions um, this morning. Right now I know or is the clock because that's where our children um, go before school and after school. Someone suggested reaching out to the churches and um, looking at that. And the clock is actually working for a special license to add more another classroom. Right. There is. But those churches Madam, would need to get licensed. Yes. Madam Chair, could I could I just ask that we reserve the chat for actual questions for the school committee um, and for this meeting? Um, the, it is beginning to devolve in the chat room, um, and I can say for one that I don't appreciate it. And I would appreciate if we could reserve the chat room for questions only and not commentary. Yes, thank you, Felicia. Um, so other than the Clark and Pot, so if churches don't have licensure, those won't necessarily be a possibility. So I'm going to give myself the task of looking at other possibilities around and maybe getting back to you, Joan, and see if there are other possibilities for families, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Just because I think that'll be important for family. And I will assist in any way I can. Yes, and I, you know, I do wanna say at this time, I know the Clark has come up um, and I know um, just, um, this is Rowan, by the way, um, that the school department has a tremendous amount of work ahead of them right now, um, given uh, all the conditions and the guidelines and how they are going to teach our children that um, I, would, I would encourage community members to help out by finding out that information and not solely relying on the school district to do that piece. Um, so Karen, volunteering that would be great. I know that the school department has a lot on their hands um, to uh, look at right now and um, that the Clark has much different regulations and um, that that's not um, something that we have to get into this evening. Um, do other school committee members have comments or questions or want to put forth a motion at this time? Madam Chair. Yes, Greg. Uh, before anyone puts, puts forward a motion, I just, I want to thank all the people that have zoomed in on this meeting tonight, uh, the parents and people from the community and the staff um, to show their, not just their interest, but their concern and what's going on in our school district and to see what we as a school committee and what their administrators are doing and, and wrestling with in hopes of educating the children of this town at the same time, uh, keeping them safe and, and the staff at the schools safe as well. Well, um, I think it speaks well that we have so many people who, who have participated and, and have asked questions and it shows that people are, are thinking about the problem. And I just, I think that while I've in the past have offered a lot of support and thanks to the administration, I want to thank the community for everything that they've done for us as well. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Greg.
So, Madam Chair, is, are you looking to entertain a motion to vote on the plans as they have been presented? If we are ready for that, I will entertain a motion. Is there additional discussion to be entertained at this moment? Or are we, has everyone asked their questions? Did you want? Yes, has every school committee member had a chance to ask questions or make comments prior to that? Um, I just, I have a question. I'm not a school committee member, but I'm a parent. Could you um, yourself, please? Yeah, I'm um, Cheyenne O'Brien. I just um, want to know what's going to happen if, you know, the kids do go back to school for even the couple hours a day, couple days a week. What's going to happen if one of the teachers or one of the students comes down with it or even comes down sick? You know what I mean? Like, are they going to have to put everybody out? If put the school down because of... Jo not Joan. knowing do you want to the test doesn't come back right away you know what i mean like what's going to happen with that they yeah. would have to um quarantine um for 10 days uh there's a guidance from desc there's certain protocols we have to follow so there's been discussion about if um we also have to do contact tracing um by having seating pan plans we have to notify parents all that would be in place. We would have. I mean, I, I understand. Like, there's a lot of people that want to send the kids back. There's a lot of people that want to do full remote learning, but to me, it just makes no sense to open up a school for a couple hours a week and put kids and teachers at risk. That's just my opinion. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I know other people don't agree with it, but. Well, thank you for sharing that opinion. And this is, and again, um, ESC has come out with guidelines for school districts on all different scenarios of if you open up and a staff member or a student comes in not feeling well. So the, I would imagine that every school district would have to follow those if people are entering the building. Correct, Joan? Yes, absolutely. Madam Chair. Yes, Greg. Hi, this is Greg Vine. I guess to, to move this along, um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what, what Larry said earlier that um, in terms of his not being in favor of fully opening the district and taking a look at either the hybrid or the fully remote um, opening. Um, I have to say that I'm not in favor of fully opening either um, and it seems to me that going to a hybrid system at this point um, may reduce the chances of exposure or someone getting sick or taking home an illness to a, a, a parent or a grandparent um, but it, it still doesn't reduce it as far as we possibly could at this point and i'm not willing to roll the dice on the health of, of my grandchildren who are in the schools here um, or the children of anybody else in this community so i guess just to move things along i'll uh, make a motion that uh, we begin the school year in the uh, fully remote uh, mode uh, again, this is to start the school year, and if things change as the year goes on um, and things look better and the uh, progression of the disease is in the direction that we want it to go, then we can certainly look at opening um, or going to a, to a hybrid or fully open uh, mode. But at this point, I, I think we should start off in the, uh, in the fully remote um, system. I'll second that motion. This is Felicia. Okay. Do we have any school committee comments or questions on that motion? <sighs> Madam Chair. Larry. 
certainly, as we've, we've said several times tonight, this will be the toughest decision we'll have to make. Um, I think it, it's so emotional for, for everyone. And both of the models that we're looking at are not uh, the panacea that we're looking for. Uh, they both have serious problems that are going to take superhuman effort to address all the issues that each one brings. In the, the remote, um, you've, we've already done remote from until June. And so we've got experience with remote. And there were, you know, some, some praise for the remote. There was also a lot of problems with the remote that parents shared on a couple of Zooms that I've listened to. Um, so accountability certainly is, is an issue that is going to be difficult under fully remote. I know that Lemonster, I don't know how Fitchburg Rowan is, if you've made any decision there, but I know Lemonster, I think it was last night, voted to remote for 10 weeks for the first term at the end of the first quarter. The first quarter, decide whether they're going to continue or if they use another model. That, that, may have some sense to it, but at the same time, you know, you, you, you're changing models, asking people to change the lifestyles. Uh, again, what happens at the end of the second year, you're going to go back to the first model. So there just isn't a good answer right now. There really is not. So, you know, I, I like the hybrid model a lot because it does get kids back into the building, it establishes a routine, it uh, handles some of the social emotional issues, and 68% of our parents have asked for that. So that's seven out of 10 parents have asked for that. So that, that is the struggle on, that I have on one side. On the other side, I'm totally empathetic to the fact that um, even with all the social distancing and wearing masks and all that kind of stuff, people are still prone to the spread of the d disease and putting them all in one building offers a different set of problems. Um, so this is a, I'm really torn by this decision. I, I don't see an upside. Uh, I, I, I just don't see an upside to either one of the models. So I'm going to listen to the other members of the committee before I commit to one model or the other. Greg made some good points for the remote model. Um, I'd like to hear what the other members have to say. And then I would be more than happy to uh, have one more, um, one more comment from the superintendent and maybe from Jonathan or one of the principals uh, as to what they're thinking before I make a decision. I've heard a lot from the parents tonight, but it would be nice to hear from Joan um, and from the parent, uh, from the administrators, what they feel. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Madam Chair, this is Felicia. Felicia. Um, I seconded so that it, we could open it up to, to discussion because I do think, I, I can't help but echo um, Larry's thoughts around, there is no good decision um, right now. The best decision is to have our students back in school, but that fully, but that's not gonna happen. Um, and it, it is the most difficult decision. I have a 16 year old myself, so I'm struggling this with this decision on my own for my own child um, and really trying to think about everyone as opposed to my child who has asthma and my own condition um, as a result of the virus um, that people, um, anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna, I won't go down that road, um, but some of the comments again um, are unnecessary. 
um, and I'm overly emotional, so I apologize, um, but there is no good decision. And it, it is important to hear from everyone. I struggle with it because how are parents going to make it work? How do you make remote work when you have more than one child? It was difficult for me with one child. Um, I am very empathetic in taking all of those things into consideration in thinking about what is the best course of action for Winton in public schools at this point. Um, the only reason why I think I lean toward the remote learning is because I agree that, first of all, we need more time. Um, I, I, I so appreciate all of the work that has been done to develop the hybrid model um, and all of the work that, that everyone has done. It's a huge, heavy lift. Um, but I don't, I, and I, I, I do feel confident that everyone has the best interests at heart and everyone has done the work and it, it, that we feel that, that we're ready to move forward with that. I, I personally think that we need more time and we've already done remote learning to Larry's point. Um, it is something that I do want to see um, more accountability. Um, I want to know that there is an actual schedule and that my child is actually being uh, connecting with their teachers um, on a regular basis, that we are actually taking attendance and we do know that our students are enrolled and working um, for whatever number of hours a day that we need them to be. Um, so I, I absolutely need that plan to be there. But again, you know, there, there's just, there's no good decision um, and, and it's, it's a struggle. So thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Karen? So my, my student just walked in and I asked for his opinion. <laughs> um, so, and, and he's as sworn as all of us are. Um, and I asked for his opinion because he's the student. Um, and he, he, um, um, like all of us has has the same fears and concerns that he wants to go to school he wants to be in school and that's what i struggle with i want my child in school too i'm i'm with kayla and all of them I would love to see my child in school um and as but i don't want my child to get sick i don't want anybody in the community to get sick because my child may be an asymptomatic carrier I'm looking at the numbers going up in our state again, and that concerns me. Um, I'm struggling over the hybrid and the um, and the fully remote too. Um, I know that remote would be very hard for a lot of our children, and that's why I have a clarifying question. If that's okay, um, now if we go remote voluntarily are we I just want to clarify this again I know we talked about it this morning Joan that still means that our highest need students still go to school full-time I don't know um, we would have to oh uh, yes actually I'm sorry excuse me we would have to make accommodations for our substantially separate students. Right. So our C1 and C2, possibly C2 students? The students that are separate classrooms. Separate. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, even I, as a superintendent, get emotional and overwhelmed uh, for our for children. Um, but also, we have to negotiate all this. Um, brought up before right and I mean this this is um this is something that I I you know because I am reading some of the things in the, in, in the chat room too not all the other stuff but you know that there are parents with special needs students that you know obviously if they're sub separate um if we go fully remote voluntarily those are the students that um Desi basically said, get these kids in. Yes. School. Yes. So they would be in school 
most likely anyways, unless we're not able to negotiate our teachers back in school. And that's, okay. out of our, that's, that's up to Greg and, and Larry to negotiate well. Um, so we'll leave that up to them. I'm just not putting you guys on. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it is, it is hard and listening to Felicia and I think that Felicia, I want to thank you very much for sharing that because, you know, your experience, because I think that a lot of people don't understand, um, that, you know, this isn't something that you just get over. It's not something that you just get and it's gone in a week or two, like the flu um, or, or even a head cold. And honestly, more and more often head colds seem to take a month or two to go away anyway. So um, I appreciate that you actually told us that. So thank you for sharing your story. I, I don't, I, I honestly, don't know which is better. There is no, there really is no good answer here for anybody. Um, you know, I know I've seen a lot of parents ask, well, why can't you leave it up to us? And we can't leave it up to the parents to make this because the parents aren't the ones that have to pay the salaries of the teachers. And you don't staff the, you don't staff the schools and you don't, you know, negotiate the contracts and everything else. And, you know, that's why we can't leave it up to parents, which, um, which plan we go with. Um, but I know that, you know, believe it or not, whether you know it or not, a lot of us read it. What, Greg? If, if I could just uh, follow up on that statement. Um, I don't think it, it's that the school committee necessarily has that right over parents to decide it's about funding and being able to properly open up given all the guidelines from the dese we can't go with three options because we don't have the staff capacity to meet all three options and have parents have choice and have the funding available to do all three options um, and the other peak factor that we have is we do have a teacher contract needs um be negotiated if we make any changes or movements with so just to clarify it's just a lot of conditions under that we and this is why the dese has required districts to pick a model and not just have three different models that parents are able to choose from if we could have that in the, right now and we do it funding and all the resources that would be wonderful because then we could come up with a scenario, but we just don't have the capacity to do that. Right. And I, I think honestly, I mean, the, the fully reopening model isn't, isn't even a possibility. We would have 25 more staff members, but that's not even, that's not even doable because we don't have the funding for that. So that's not been an option and we don't have the space. For two reasons that's not even open to us so it's really the two models that we have open to us are the hybrid and the remote and as a special ed parent i will be honest that I, you know i would honestly like to go towards the hybrid um, because i think that it's important for our children to be in school as much as possible but it, I'm really very concerned about illness. So I'm, I'm still torn. So now it's your turn, Lauren. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I hear what everyone is saying. And I hear also uh, the community wanting to have their kids back in school. And I know the motion right now is a, for a full remote. Um, I also heard, uh, you know, the question of the uh, needy kids. Uh, the most needy kids coming up 
Um, and if we're in full remote, that we actually would have students coming back into the building because they need that. My question really is, but isn't that a modified hybrid? Because then we are asking kids to come into the building um, that we know really can only access education through um, direct teaching model and um, not a full remote model. And the other thing too is just talking about hybrid because I was thinking, I've been thinking about this every day for months. Um, are we, you think of hybrid um, and coming in, is it really then a calendar issue? When is it safe to do that? That's, that's the bottom line that we have to look at. When is it gonna be safe to bring a larger group of kids and adults back into the building? Is it based on the model or is it based on the calendar of when that might be possible? So sometimes I'm left with more questions than I have comments or answers to <laughs> because um, as you all know, my background is in special education and I feel very strongly that the best model for all kids is in person, but really for kids with high needs, they have to be back in school. Um, and I really am struggling with that, but I also am struggling with the fact that if we bring them back and any one of them or a staff member were to get sick, that it would be devastating um, to the school and community. So that's where I'm left at. A very hard decision along with everybody else. Madam Chair, we want to hear from, from the superintendent and yeah. Hey, yeah. Be no. Felicia. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to um, speak on behalf of after being in meetings with them since March of last year, um, unless you want to hear from them, I, I or if you don't want to speak, um, you're welcome to. Um, this is our decision. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Joan, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if anyone else is, but you may want to take yourself off camera as well. It does really help to clear up the your voice. Thank you. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes. thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've been struggling with this since last March um, for our educators, our students, for the community. Um, so everyone has concerns. We have all have concerns about people that uh, work in the district um, for campers. Uh, people have concerns for their families and um, everyone's situation is different. The reason um, the reason why the leadership was leaning towards a hybrid was because we don't know when the cases are going to increase. And, and I agree with Alicia said before, we'd have to close down right away. The, the students um, if we have to go remote for the year, they're never going to meet the teachers. There's never going to be those connections um, with the teachers. They'll only see them on a video. So the stat, the leadership team just wanted a small window of time and cognizant of the fact that we have to watch the metrics very carefully to, to meet their students and put systems in place and offer them support. They haven't seen the students in their school since last March. We're worried about the social emotional health. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of information out there um, across the country, uh, especially in the comma of kids suffering from severe depression. They don't have um, contact with, um, for school is very important to students. Um, and, um, so to be able to have that time to reassure them that I, you know, we're going to be here to help them. They're going to, the teachers are going to be here to help them. 
um, I still certainly, um, and I'll let anyone add to that. Um, I sincerely appreciate the amount of meetings parents have attended. I'm sorry. And uh, adding input and in developing these plans, no matter what happens. Um, we do care about all the children in Wichington and the staff, and there is no right answer. This is a horrible situation. And the only thing um, is I don't get a vote. <laughs> so I, I, I respect the difficult decision that the um, school committee would have. But we were really um, in wanting to recommend that really concerned about the social, emotional, and the connections uh, for the children and to get systems in place so they can be, um, uh, you know, a, a system in place. They know who to get in contact with um, and they see people and they know that everyone is working for them. I will respect any decision you make tonight, but I wanted you to know that the leadership team worked um, with different focus groups. Um, and uh, I had two parent for focus groups last week with 84, 85 people. Uh, people have been unbelievable uh, about coming out and asking questions and, and people came out this morning. Um, and I will continue that no matter what model. But I, I certainly um, hear all the concerns of the parents. I hear everyone's concern. I, I don't think there's a right or wrong, you know, it's just what people feel. I don't know if anyone in the leadership team would like to add something. Hi, yeah, this is Michelle Adder, um, principal at Memorial School. Thank you, Joan. I think, um, you know, I do, I want to mirror everything that you have said. You know, it has been an extremely difficult process. And I think every single question that parents are bringing forth, those are questions that as an admin team, we have all brought forth as well. And right, you're right, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, I think as teachers, as educators, we, we want to see our kids, you know, we need to see their faces. We are concerned about the social, emotional well-being, you know, of our students, but, you know, at the same time of our staff as well. So, right, there is no right or wrong answer. And I, I think that no matter what decision is made tonight, as Joan has said, as well as, you know, our admin team, that we will we will do whatever we need to do regardless of what decision is made and you know we will move forward and try to do the best we can with all you know all the ups and downs and all the various factors that are going to play into whatever model we chose so i i mean i want to thank joan the parents and everyone else on the admin team because we you know we have put a lot of time and effort into all this knowing that um there is not a, there's not a right answer so thank you Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Joan, this yes, is Mary. Oh. Hi, Mary. Um, I just wanted to add that um, one of the reasons I would like to go remote is, is everything you guys have been saying, but also I think in order for students to be able to get a well-rounded education in such a difficult time, they need to build those relationships with the staff. They need to build those relationships with admin so that they know who they can talk to and where they can go and that we truly care about them. And then it's going to be easier for us to be able to work with them should we have to go remote down the road. Um, but social emotional piece is extremely, extremely important. And we need to build those relationships so that we can help them and build a positive social emotional program around their needs. And that's one of the main reasons I, I like remote um, but again, it's a very difficult situation. It's not an easy decision. And no matter what you decide, I support whatever you decide. This Hi, is John. This is... Oh, go ahead. Jess, were you speak? Go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's okay. This is Jess with Zena. Um, first, thank you, Larry, for um, you know asking for our opinions. And, and Joan, we all are with you and completely agree. Um, for me, um, I have looked at the parent survey 
um, and looked at all the other information that we've gotten from parents um, and from the community. Um, myself as a parent, I need to decide what I'm doing for my incoming sixth grader and third grader. Um, for me, I lean towards the hybrid model because there is a remote option for our, those parents who want their child to go all remote, and then there is an option for those parents who want to send their kids in person. Um, it's also, this would be the time to have our kids come into school. We don't know what is happening um, down the line when flu season comes out, but the numbers where they're looking at right now. Um, but again, uh, as I answered the, the, um, the parent uh, survey, I do feel comfortable sending my kids to school in a hybrid model. Um, but I think that whatever the school committee chooses, we as administrators um, will take that decision and make sure that we can um, put all of those systems in place for the kids and, and what they need um, for their education. So again, I thank you guys for letting us speak our opinion. Thanks, Jessica. And Joan, this is Mary. Can I clarify? Um, yes. I can't remote what I was talking about was hybrid. I, I realize. That. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, I meant hybrid. <laughs> um, if I if I could say a couple words, first of all, I feel um, that Joan oh, you identify yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Jonathan Lamb, director of instruction curriculum. I really think Joan summed up the overwhelming like feeling that I have about this and thank thank her for for kind of speaking for you know for, you know the sentiment um, that I think the administrators have been have been sharing with each other I just wanted to throw a couple additional thoughts out there um, which are really more more kind of logistical um, but they matter um, right now uh, the testing the testing data in Massachusetts, is well below the threshold that um, uh, we are being told is the threshold at which we should not, we should be looking at closing back down again. And we're well within the threshold where people are saying that it, it makes sense to open schools. And my feeling is that we should strike while the iron is hot. We have you just heard these wonderful comments from everybody about how important it is to our kids to have the opportunity to get to know uh, their teachers to build connections and relationships, um, to get get themselves uh, oriented to all of these these uh, platforms and tools that we're going to be using for the work this year. Um, and I feel like if if we if we bring them back um, while the data is good, um, then if the if the numbers start to go in a, in a dangerous direction, we will have put ourselves in a position to have a more successful experience. Uh, if when we go to remote, um, and uh, you know, I very, I'm very respectful of uh, you know Larry's concern about um, you know the switching of models, but we've talked a lot about um, preparing in advance so that when we have to do that, at least at the on the school side, um, we will be able to make that switch. I do understand that for families, that switch could be very, very disruptive. But on the school side of things, I think we can make we can we can be planful and be ready to do to do that 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 switching. So I just I think I want to just put those two points out there, and then the one kind of follow up to that, also logistical, um, is it's my suggestion would not be to put a time timeline on the hybrid. I think what makes sense from a public health standpoint is to that apparently Desi is working towards trying to establish some some metrics, um, some reasonable metrics for, you know, during which you, you might keep schools open or close them. And I would recommend that um, the school committee take a position if you decide to go with a hybrid model where you try to keep school open until the point in hybrid, in hybrid form, until the point where the metrics say we shouldn't anymore. Um, and I realize I, this is an excru excruciating decision and we'll respect. Why the chicken bone? What do you mean? Thank you. Can we make sure that we're on mute? Madam Chair, this is Felicia. Um, I just want to clarify one thing, Jonathan, because you did say that we're under, you know, we're, we're well within the rate of, you know, schools opening. But Massachusetts as a state is seeing an uptick, an uptick in viruses since mid-July. 
so while we're still under that, we are beginning to see an increase in cases. So we have to think about that. Um, I, I'll go back to, um, and, and even though we don't, <laughs> it's difficult to consider um, Greg's point that he made earlier um, with people making certain personal choices um, that may not be the best for the, um, the, that may not be the, the best decisions for everyone. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that, that we're under, we're, we're definitely well within that, but we are as a state seeing an uptick in cases since mid July. Uh, 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 and then chair, can I just say something in response to that? That might be helpful. I, uh, I, I, I think you're absolutely right that the, the rising the rising test results are very obviously very concerning to all of us. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, the superintendent um, mentioned that what you're put out there that whatever happens now, the data on the ground could change could change the plans. I think this goes to, actually what you're saying actually goes to what I was it, 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 it fits with what I was saying in that, I think if the if the if the committee were to vote for a hybrid model, you could vote for a hybrid model. It says, but if the data keeps going in the wrong direction when it hits a certain threshold, we'll change our mind and we will actually open remote. I mean, and I don't know, we don't have that threshold from the state yet, but we've been told that maybe we would get one next week. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, yep, Larry, can can we move the question? I think we've heard from everybody. Yes. So the, just because it's been a little bit of time, we do have a motion on the floor um, for to start the year in a full remote model. We do have a second on that. So should this be a I roll call vote? Call. Or? I think it should be a roll call. Roll call vote, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, so we'll start. Uh, Karen, do you unmute yourself, please? Sorry, I had to find the mute. Um, so I'm going to vote now. Alicia. Yes. Greg. Aye. Larry. No. And the chair votes no. <clears throat> the motion for full re remote at this time is no. So now I'd like to make a motion that we consider the hybrid model as presented by the superintendent and our administrative team for acceptance. I'll second okay. that. Yeah. So we have now on the floor the remote hybrid model, uh, well, the hybrid model, excuse me, and it's been seconded. Again, we will go through a roll call. Well, discussion first, right? If oh, anybody, yep, we could have a discussion first. <laughs> if anybody, I know we've kind of beat beaten this to death, but somebody may want to make a comment. Ma Madam Chair, Greg, um, I just want to say I know I I put forward the the previous motion and has been mentioned by everyone. You know, this is the decision that everyone has been torn on, but. Um, I just want to say that that it's my hope that in voting on this, that um, we can make this uh, a unanimous vote, just so that the people of this community know that we're fully behind this. I'm sorry, Greg. Could yeah, you hold on, just yourself if you are on. Go ahead, Greg. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, you know, and I'm hoping that we can make this a unanimous vote um, so that the community knows that we're fully behind the the plan that we do decide and that we're all going to put our 
our best foot forward and do what we can to see that this is implemented um, as best it can be. Um, and so I, I intend to vote yes, and I hope that we can make this a unanimous vote. That's all I have to say, thank yeah, you. Mary, any other um, comments from the committee? Yeah, I just take issue with that, Greg. I'm, I'm not gonna vote for this because I feel strongly about starting in remote learning and it certainly doesn't mean that I don't support the administration and I won't support the decision that is obviously going to be made by the school committee. Um, so thank you for that, but I'm, I'll just make my vote known now that it, it is a no. I, I do not support the hybrid model, but thank you. Thank you, any other comments? No. I think we're ready to vote. Okay, so we will go through uh, the vote, which is on the table now, which is for the hybrid model. Um, and it's another roll call. Uh, so I'll start again with Karen. Yes. Greg. Yeah, uh, I. Felicia. No. Larry. Yes. And the chair is I. Uh, the motion passes for the hybrid model. Anybody have any comments or uh, that they'd like to make at this time from the committee about their decision or shall we move on to the calendar? Madam Chair? Yes, Karen? So, well, I told you you're gonna get used to saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the reasons, and, and I think it's because as Jonathan said, I think it is really important again for our, for our students to get into school and, and build the relationships i think that is going to make a huge difference for our students and then if we need to switch i think we will be able to make the switch but i also think it is um, very important that these students um, have the chance to make that in-person connection so that was a big factor for me thank you Madam Chair. Yes, Larry. And for me, I guess what the, the tipping point was a couple of things. Um, one is we've already done the remote learning and that was um, something that we can always go back to and improve upon. Um, but so, you know, as Jonathan said, while the the numbers are, are low and below the recommended um, 5%, we're at 2.88. Um, this is a good time to, to try another strategy to get our kids back into the buildings and back into school, even on a limited basis. And I'm confident that the administration is going to do everything they can to keep our staff and students safe and make the uh, experience um, a positive one. And so we've got two strategies that we can fall back on. We have, we'll try this hybrid model and who knows what's gonna happen down the line, especially with flu season coming. And if we have to go back to remote, we've already got that one in our back pocket. So, and the, the third thing that I wanted to say is that with the hybrid model too, if, if parents are nervous that, that they can uh, choose the remote model if that's what they so desire. So um, again, it, there's no great panacea to this big issue, but it at least we'll have another strategy that we've used and we have experience with. And um, we can, if we do have to transition, we can. Agreed, Larry. So, Madam Chair, this is Felicia. Uh um, I, I would just like to say the reason why I voted no is because of the fact that we do see an increase in cases. We see an increase in cases in states that surround us as well. Um, I do not believe that at this time, um, bringing students back together is the right decision for any school district, um, not just Winchenden. Um, I find it that I, I really am concerned about how we are going to keep them 
um, socially distanced. I am concerned about how we're going to keep them wearing masks. <laughs> I am concerned that our teachers are going to be doing more managing and wrangling than they are doing teaching. Um, and that is not meant um, in any way, shape or form um, to be disparaging to our teachers or to our administrators. Um, again, I, I will support this um, because this is what the school committee has decided as a whole. But for me personally, and I have made that decision for my daughter as well, and just in general, and what I have been through myself. Um, no, it's not a disease, but I can tell you that when you have it, it, it doesn't just go away. Um, I've been dealing with it since March. So I sincerely hope that this decision does not put our students, teachers, administrators, parents um, at risk. Um, so thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Felicia. I know that, that everybody's had a really hard decision to make tonight and I just wanna reiterate a lot of what um, Larry had said. Um, the reason I chose hybrid is because you have the choice of a full remote model. And right now we, our community is telling us um, that 68% of families want to have some type of in-person. And I believe that right now might be the only time to capture that. I understand that we're seeing increases um, in cases and I wanna support the administration and what they said that they may have a very small window to see some kids back into the building, to build relationships, to make a very um, more comprehensive remote model because what I don't wanna see is um, a very similar remote model to the spring. I don't think a lot of our community members were happy with that in families, and we need to do a better job at that uh, moving forward. And so I wanna support that. I am leery that it may be a very small window, and I um, know that Joan and her administration are going to take into consideration all of the health aspects that the DESC has put forward, which is a tremendous amount of regulations and guidelines in order to come back to school. Um, and if they aren't able to do that, they will alert the school committee and the, and the community of that when um, they, if, the, if that comes about. Um, but I wanna have faith that the social distancing piece and the masks and the PPE, um, uh, with the DESE regulations are going to be in place and we're a small community that can uh, work together to do that. And that's why the, I made the decision at this time. So moving forward in the agenda, um, we have now the school calendar for next year to review. Uh, so Joan, do you want to go ahead and um, review that? Joan, you might be on mute. I can't see you though, so. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I asked Jessica to put it on the screen. I appreciate it. But first I wanna say thank you everyone uh, again at this meeting. And I, sorry I got emotional, but I worry about the staff and the students um, and, and have been since everyone is and it's only the seriousness of it tonight so I hope you understand and I also saw a student's post that said um, some information about you know meeting new people and stuff and that kind of I apologize for that but it's because here. so this is the school calendar that we're putting forward for uh, the beginning of school. We thought it was important for um, the parents to know the plans for school, no matter what plan we were under. I did meet with the uh, WTA today um, and made some changes to that tonight. So originally the plan was to have professional development 
August 25th and 26th. We are not having professional development on that those two days because uh, we have 10 days that the commissioner gave us to do all the training and work we need to do. So two full weeks. So we're holding those two days. We had to tr transition quickly um, from one plant to another. So, so we have those days. If that was the case though, we would have to, um, right now it's saying that school ends, I believe on June 14th and it would have to, it would have to uh, end two days um, later for the 170. So um, the 10 days are marked on the calendar that the teachers would be in the building. That's the professional development. They will start on the 27th, 28th and 31st. Um, we kept the original, uh, then you have the first, second, third, the eighth, ninth, 10th, and 11th. Those are the eight days of professional development that make up the hundred and school days that was granted um, by the commissioner. The rest of the uh, calendar looks the same. We did uh, remove some of the um, PD half days, feeling that um, we, we could work that into the um, schedule, either the remote or the uh, hybrid, the fully remote. And um, also capped at the end of the year, the 7th through the 11th in June, those are half days for high school exams, but also those are typically half, half days for the rest of the school system so that um, class, uh, staff could talk about um, what the uh, makeup of the classes for the fall. So that was a change that we made. So school would start for the students on September 14th. That's when school will start. Of course, it will depend on what cohort. Or if, I'm gonna say this again, if, if the um, situation uh, with the coronavirus changes over the next month, um, I'll ask the um, school to make committee to um, revote or if we receive guidance from that we have to close schools. Don't know if anyone has any questions. I have no questions at this point. Thank you. No questions for me. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you to the leadership team and the executive board of the uh, WDA uh, for both working on this. Appreciate it. So do we, um, would this be an appropriate time to put forward a motion to accept the calendar as put, put forward by the superintendent? Yes. We hear a second make, on I that make, motion. I make that motion. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. <laughs> it's Felicia. I'll second it. So we have on the floor a uh, vote for the upcoming school year uh, calendar. Um, do I have? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, so the school calendar as I was new that sorry. You're booted. Oh, sorry, Larry. I'm screaming, aye, aye, aye. And I noticed I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the calendar for the uh 2020-21 school year is uh been approved. Um, we had moved up the public comments, uh, throughout the meeting. Are there any other additional school committee comments at this time? I do have, um, of course, this is Felicia. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, 
make make a statement both it, it's more personally than it is a, as a member of the school committee but um some of the things that i have seen on social media recently have been very disturbing to me um we recently had a young woman um, put forth a petition um i don't remember the exact words of it but we actually had parents that attacked this young woman um on social media and really it was so completely disheartening um and it is the usual suspects that are um show up on the friends of of murdoch or whatever that page is um and that are continuously negative um not looking to be a part of any solution um and who took it upon themselves to uh, attack this i think she's 14 years old and i just want to say um <laughs> that is what social media obviously is for um that's what people use it for but shame on you and for anyone to attack a young woman who is putting forth an idea and trying to be a part of the solution um, in such troubling times for people to feel like that they, that it was okay, that they could get a pass because they, they don't, they certainly don't have to voice it. All they have to do is type it, um, is despicable. I, I would like to say, I don't know who hosts the Friends of Murdoch or the Friends of Winchenden page, whatever that page is. Um, but again, just like I did, had to say tonight, um, the chat page is for questions, not for disparaging comments. Um, and, and again, the Friends of, of the, the Winchenden school system or whatever that page is, was set up for the purpose of people to be able to share ideas, to ask questions, to get information um, for something that is positive. And it really has turned negative. And it, it, there, there are the usual suspects um, and the same people that continue to hijack posts on that when we have people that are moving into town that ask a question about something and then before you know it, the conversation devolves. Um, and, and I, for one, um, would like to see it stop. And again, I don't know who um, administers that page, who is the administrator of that page, I would like to find out because I do think, and I do know that there are ways that we can um, shut, shut those people down. Um, so that is just my one comment for tonight. We're all working very, very hard. Um, you hear it in everyone's voice. And while I may not be happy with the decision that was made tonight, I stand by our district and our administrators and our superintendent and teachers, um, they are working very hard to make this work. You can hear it in their voice. You can see it in the hours that they put in. And for people to just take social media and run with it because they can be behind a keyboard um, really is despicable. So I, I just, I wanna thank you um, for allowing me this, this moment in time. Um, but I, it really, it was, it was almost the straw that broke the camel's back for me um, this week to see that. So um, thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Madam Chair. Greg. Um, if I can, just to, to follow up a, a little bit actually on, on Felicia's comments um, regarding some of the comments in the chat uh, section tonight. Um, and normally I don't bother in terms of uh, defending what I do, but I just wanted to say that my decision to vote with the majority in terms of the uh, going to the hybrid tonight had nothing to do with standing my ground or not standing my ground. Um, it had to do with the fact that we have enough going on locally, statewide, and certainly nationally that, that divides us all. Division seems to be the, the watchword of the day. And I just wanted to vote in favor of it to show that um, even though I might disagree with the decision that I was willing to, to go along with it, to give it my support because it looked like that's the, the decision that was going to be made and to let people know that I stand with uh, the administrators and the teachers and, and Felicia has voiced it herself. She may not have voted 
uh, with the rest of us, but that's that's fine. But um, and, you know, to to imply that I was not standing my ground, I think is a little bit insulting. And uh, I just wanted to, to let people know that there was a reason that I did that, and it was to show some unity and perhaps lessen the divisions that are out there. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Greg. Madam Chair, um, I just wanted to thank everybody um, for their feedback and the community members. And I wanted to thank all of you my colleagues on school committee and the administrators and teachers and parents and lunch ladies, everybody. Um, because I think it's, it's amazing all the work that's been put into this. And I know that a lot of us haven't slept. I know for a fact that I don't think Joan sleeps more than two or three hours a night, um, from what I can tell. And um, I think that no matter, I, I think everybody's nerves were afraid, and I think that everybody is feeling um, very emotional at this point. You know, some of us, you know, some of you work in school districts in addition to voluntarily being on school committee and, um, you know, volunteering to make the hard decisions, but, um, you know, we all need to learn how to be civil to each other and respect that we're all making hard decisions at this point. And um, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time out of their own personal lives and out of their own fears and anxieties for their own families and everything they may be going through because we don't know what each person is going through themselves to take the time to put the children and the community of Winchenden um, at the forefront and to make the hard decisions. So thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Larry? Well, it's been a, it's been a long struggle tonight and it's been very difficult for the last few weeks. Uh, I do wanna commend Greg for his willingness to show his support for Joan and her administrative staff by, uh, you know, sharing his vote with the winning side, um, just as a uh, show of good, good faith that we trust our administrators and we trust that they're going to do the right things for our staff and our kids. And so that was a, a great thing on your part, Greg, to do. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I do appreciate that. Uh, as I said in the beginning, and I, I'm just going to end on this, it's been a, a terrible, difficult, and uh, gut-wrenching decision that we had to make, and we've landed on something, and now we need to uh, pull together and make it work. And I know we will, because we have in the past. Um, we, we're winching and strong, and we can do this. And if the winds change, and as Felicia said, things keep going the wrong direction, then we can make the adjustment and we've got another plan. So um, roll up your sleeves, everybody, because there's a lot of work to do. And thank you for the work that you've already done. And to every parent that was on tonight, you love your kids, and that is the greatest treasure that we can take away from this. Whether you were for or against or whatever, you showed up, um, as John Lewis said, right? You speak up and you show up and you make a difference. And I, I think, you know, having uh, 70 people show up has been a great thing. So thank you very much, everybody, and let's move forward. Thank you, Larry, and I just wanna reiterate a thank you to everyone and all their hard work and that no decision is an easy decision, nor is it the right decision for 100% of the people um, in this community. Um, and that any point in time, we're gonna be making other decisions and um, it's a revolving door for a while. Um, so 
I appreciate all the hard work you all put into it and um, informing us in the community and having all your parent forms, Joan, um, is greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you for that. You. Um, I do believe the last thing on our agenda is uh, we do have on tonight uh, executive session. Do I have a motion for? Um, before we go, before we yeah. do that, <laughs> if I can ask, um, because I didn't, and, and I may just have missed it. Do we have a, a link? I'm doing, Greg, I missed it. Um, I'm, I'm sending you a link right now. It's oh, okay. All right. In an invite. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, then, Madam Chair, I would make um, a motion that we go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and chair so declares and not to reconvene in open session. I second, second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I think, doesn't it require a roll yeah. call to go into executive session? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. It does. Yeah. Karen? Aye. Felicia? Aye. Greg? Aye. Mary? Aye. And the chair has aye. And we have now moved into executive session. And everybody have a good evening. Thank you.